Okay, welcome everyone. This is a capstone lecture on project time management. We have already done a lot of exercises on time management and we've talked at length about some of the key concerns in managing the project's time period. Uh, we'll take this lecture as a capstone lecture in which we'll cover some of things that we have already talked about briefly and we'll also talk about some of the things that we have not uh, spoken about so far in more uh, details right so the objectives of uh, project time management um, segment is to sort of familiar our, uh, familiarize ourselves with how to um, manage and how to define the project schedule Number two is to learn how to develop network diagrams, and number three is to understand the concept of the critical path method. Um, now, there's different components of time management. These include activity planning, uh, which includes basically this idea of thinking about each individually, uh, in individual activity by itself, and then determining how long that activity is going to take and how much resources, et cetera, that we're going to have on it. Um, but the discrete set of concerns that we have when planning an activity is that we're trying to plan when to begin that activity and the nature of that particular activity, right? So we're thinking about a particular deliverable and then we're breaking it down into smaller activities and we're saying that these are a set of activities that an individual or a group has to perform. Uh, so that's the idea of activity planning. Now, once an activity has been planned out, the next step is to see what precedes that activity versus what succeeds a particular activity. That is to say, what comes before an activity and what is going to occur after an activity. The things that precede an activity in the sequence means that those activities, when they come to an end, their output is going to become the input for the activity of your concern. And when the activity of your concern finishes, the output of that becomes the input for the next uh, succeeding activity. So therefore, it is important to think in terms of the sequence uh, that exists amongst these activities as well. Um, the third thing that we have to do is that we have to think about the resource estimation. So here we're thinking about how much, uh, how many individuals that we require in order to perform a work for us, uh, for example, right? For example, we can think about an activity let's call it activity B, and let's suppose it is going to require 40 uh, man hours to complete. So that means that one person is required in order to perform that 40 hours per work for us, because one person working full time does a 40 hours of work in a given uh, week's uh, time period, considering that the person is working in a single uh, shift type of an environment. So if we want to finish a 40 hour piece of work in five days, then we require one person. Uh, but if we consider this, that this 40 hours of work has to be done in, let's suppose, two days of time. So that means that one person cannot do this because that person has to do uh, about 20 hours of work in a day. So if that person works for two days in, in this type of an environment, then they'll be uh, able to finish that 40 hours of work in, in two days time period. So clearly this is a violation of a lot of the HR rules and there's safety and uh, health concerns as well because we really don't want people working 20 hours per day. Uh, meaning they don't get time to eat, they don't get time to sleep, they don't get time for the families and so on and so forth. So 20 hour work days is unrealistic. So what if we have two people, right? If we've got two people, then we've got one person doing eight hours, the other person doing eight hours in a day. So that's 16 hours. 16 plus 16 on the second day is 32 hours. So two people is not enough. What if we've got three people? So if we've got three people all working full time, so that's 24 hours in the first day, 24 hours in the second day, that's 48 hours. So that's eight more hours than what we require in those two days, which is that we're looking for 40 hours of, of work. So when we start thinking about activity resource estimation, we're trying to think in the, these terms as to how many individuals are needed. So clearly what we require is about two and a half people working 
on our, our uh, activity in order to complete a 40 hours of work in two days, right? Some of these people can be working full time, some can be working part time, etc. So some sort of combination has to be thought out so that these 40 hours could be completed in, in the two days. So that's the activity resource estimation. Now, the duration estimation is concerned about how long an activity normally takes, right? So you may want to do something much more faster, but is it possible, right? So it may be possible to do that work in a shorter amount of period of time, but then there's natural processes and nature takes its own time period in order for, for something to complete. So we're not only thinking about the minimum time that we need to complete an activity, we're also thinking about the number of people required in order to complete that activity in that minimum amount of time period that we have available. Right? So that's the sense behind activity resource estimation and its duration estimation. So once we know the activities that we have to do, we know the sequence amongst those activities, meaning we know what comes before, what comes after. We know the duration. So now we can start thinking about the network diagram and we, we basically take that sequencing logic and put it into uh, uh, put it in the shape of a diagram so that we can see where it is that those critical or those important activities reside so that we can manage our project better right now once we have figured out what the critical path is then we can control our project and see wherever we feel, feel that there's a delay being encountered then we're going to exercise some sort of a mechanism in order to make sure that that delay is overcome somehow. Uh, that may entail borrowing uh, resources from other activities which are not on the critical path, uh, thereby allowing us to complete our project on time. Right? So this is uh, a broad uh, overview of what's going on in, in project time management. Right? So uh, in more detail, activity or more formally, acti activity definition, it entails identifying the specific scheduled activities that need to be performed to produce the various project deliverables. Right? So this is what we're doing. Where do we get this from? We'll normally be getting this from the word breakdown structure, which if you recall, is composed of two levels. One is that there's a product decomposition taking place. And the second layering of the WBS is that that product becomes assignable. That smallest piece of that big project becomes assignable either to a group or an individual. And if that group or individual performs their work, then that particular deliverable or piece of that deliverable is going to be produced for us, right? So we're thinking very closely in terms of the WBS and we're uh, taking it one step further from what we had done in the scope knowledge area, which is we decompose the product into small pieces. And at, as soon as we get into the time knowledge area, the first step that we do is that we decompose that uh, WBS one level more so that we have a set of activities coming up, right? So that's the activity definition. Now, activity sequencing, as I said before, is simply concerned about identifying and documenting the dependencies that exist, right? Meaning what is depending, dependent upon what, what precedes something. Right? We're normally not very concerned about what succeeds a particular activity. We're more concerned about what precedes it, right? So in that way, we're thinking about what are the inputs? Where are my inputs? Who is producing my input? Who is approving my input? When do I get my input so that I can begin my next step, right? So that's the sequencing. Resource estimation is a concern about estimating the type and quantities of resources required to perform each scheduled activity. So we're not only thinking about manpower, we are also thinking about capital resources and financial resources required in order to perform a particular work. So we're thinking about machines, we're thinking about money, we're thinking about people, right? And we're loading our activities, right? That's an important concern where we, uh, you know, if we identify that two people are needed, so then the immediate concern is who are those two people uh, so that they can be loaded with that work, right? So that's an additional concern that we will have in our minds here as well, right? 
and I'll talk about that more and uh, something called the resource breakdown structure. Now, once that uh, is done, the next step is to estimate the duration of that activity, right? Uh, which means that we're thinking, um, you know, how long do we want to spend on that activity uh, as opposed to how long that activity normally takes, right? So it may normally take 10 days, but do you want to spend 10 days with one person performing an activity or is it possible to do an maybe five days or six days or whatever have you by throwing more people uh, into the project. So we're concerned about that figure, right? What is the least amount of time that we want to spend on a particular activity? Schedule development requires that we sequence out these activities and we produce basically uh, our, our network diagram and, and then uh, place that on top of the Gantt chart and put our holidays and our break times into it and our, um, you know, the, the shifts that we've got running so that we can go from the amount of um, uh, working days into the calendar days, right? So schedule development is this idea of actually taking your network diagram and developing your Gantt chart, which is your formal uh, calendar days uh, that are required to produce your project. Uh, control is, um, is something that is normally uh, not exercised all the time, right? Rather, uh, we have to think about instances where control needs to be exercised. So we need to think clearly um, about this, this concept. And we have to think that, you know, when is it that control is necessary uh, for, for us to implement, right? So what, how do we understand this? The, the concept is that we've got a plan, and then the concept is that we've got a reality, right? The reality runs um, separate to the plan, right? There's many things that happen in reality which we may not have planned for. Now, we may have cases where whatever we had planned, we find that the reality is res responding in the same way. Uh, as we had planned. So if the reality is working in alignment with your plan, then there's no need to exercise control. But we may have instances where our reality is um, lagging behind the plan. For example, we thought that in three days we would do uh, X, Y, Z tasks. And when we actually uh, go through the reality, we find that by the end of three days, we've only done one or two of the tasks, meaning one or two are left. So in that way, the reality has fallen behind the plan. So if we find that, we normally say that there is now a uh, misconfiguration or a configuration mismatch between the plan and the reality. So in such cases, then we have to exercise control. Now, there may also be a case where the reality is ahead of the plan, meaning that we thought that we'll take three days to do something, but it took us one day. That is also going to be a concern for us because in that case, we're going to wonder whether there have been some quality compromises or is it the case that certain amount of work got left and was uh, left incomplete, right? So if we find that there is no quality compromise, or if we find that no amount of work is left and there is no quality compromise, then there is no need to exercise any control. In that case, we did better than we thought that we'll be able to do, right? So control is, is this idea that we have to keep in the back of our mind. It requires that a lot of monitoring happens Monitoring would entail collecting of data. Once that data has been collected, it has to be evaluated. And based upon that evaluation of the monitoring data, we're going to find out whether our plans and reality are in alignment with each other or not. So in the cases where there's a misalignment between the plan and the reality, then those are the cases where we start exercises, uh, exercising control. Now, things that we have to remember, uh, and, and not for, for the purpose of the exam, so to speak, but um, things that are good practices, right? These are some of the things that you have to recall for that. One is that estimates should be based upon the WBS to improve the accuracy of the estimate. So if you don't have a WBS, 
you actually should have one. And if you have AWBS, then you need to make sure that you're making your estimates based upon your WBS because that will aid in improving the accuracy. Number two, the estimates should be done by the person doing the work, right? So when we're trying to estimate the duration of a particular activity, we shouldn't be coming up with a number by, by ourselves. Rather, we should be asking those people that do such activities on a day-to-day -day basis in order to give us an idea of how long that activity is going to take, right? So get the estimates from the person doing the work. Now, if you have some historical information, please do use it because that removes this, uh, this blankness from this picture, which is uh, what I'm trying to say is that it, it gives you some sense of how long something took before, or it gives you some sense of how much uh, something costed before, right? So if you have some historical information, you should rely on it because it gives more reality to the plans that you're making up, right? Um, the fourth point is that scheduled baselines should be maintained, right? Meaning that once we have come up with, with some sort of a baseline, whether it's a time baseline, and if we're not talking about time, we may be talking about scope or quality or resources, et cetera. There are several baselines in a project, specifically for right now, the time baseline. Time baseline means the time period of the project. So once we have determine that an activity is going to take this many days and the set of activities combined together forming a project is going to take this many days. That means we've got a baseline. So once we have a baseline, we have to adhere to that baseline. We have to make sure that we're maintaining that baseline. We're not violating that baseline. If we violate that baseline, then we are going to be falling behind. So we don't want our project to be late. So we have to make sure that our baselines are maintained. The scheduling of the project should be managed to the scheduled baseline. So once you have your schedule, you've got your estimates, you've placed, uh, you know, you've, you've aligned your activities, and then you've pa pasted them on the Gantt chart and put in your holidays and vacations, et cetera, into it, then you have to make sure that you manage it according to that. So the Gantt chart is basically your schedule baseline, and you have to make sure that you do that. Now, any changes uh, to the project schedule are, are possible, uh, but we have to go through a thoughtful process in order to integrate some certain changes into the project, right? If we don't put thought into it, then something happens, which is that scope creep and feature creep happens, uh, which can cause for delays. So we don't want these willy-nilly changes to be coming into our project and causing a muck or a mess for us. Rather, what we need to do is that we have to implement something called the ICC, which is the idea. Uh, and the thought is that we've got a change control system, an integrated change control mechanism, ICC, integrated change control. So that means that there must be some sort of a board, some sort of a group. And whenever a change comes, changes, if you remember, would be of two types. There could be change requests or there could be change orders. Change request means that a request for change comes. It has to be evaluated. The evaluation is going to decide how much of an impact that change is going to have on your time, your scope, your quality, and the cost of the project. And if the uh, effect is minimal, then you can accept that change, but then you have to integrate that change and make sure that you implement that change. On the other hand, you could have a change order in which case somebody is saying to you, you must do this in that particular way. So in that case, you still evaluate the impact for it and you plan for it and then you integrate it into your uh, baseline. Uh, but it's not happening without thought. Whether it's a change request or a change order, this thought pattern has to be there. And once that thought has been defined, and uh, the evaluation has been done, we integrate these changes, right? So any kind of changes into our schedule or any, any idea of a change in a project must come through the integrated change control uh, system or a change control board. So we need to have that in, uh, present and, and we have to have uh, all the impacts evaluated and presented and then a decision is going to be made about whether to integrate it. 
And once we decide to integrate a change, we have to not only update our plans, we also have to make that assignable, we have to give that task to somebody, then we have to monitor it and control it and all that. Those things will also happen, right? Um, now, estimation of uh, activities should not take place at, at the overall level of that activity. Rather, estimates have to take place at each individual little word package that takes place within an activity, right? So we're um, estimating at the smallest level and then we're combining our estimates together to form the overall estimate. Um, corrective actions or preventive actions wherever possible have to be taken. So if you find that there is a flaw somewhere, there is a mishap about to you know, take place or something has gone wrong, so in that case, you have to take remedial actions to correct it. So wherever you find an opportunity to make corrections or take preventive measures, then you should uh, do that. Um, don't blindly accept the requirements or changes to requirements that have to take place to the integrated change control. Uh, revisions of plans are necessary because um, the reality is not a static reality, rather realities are dynamic. So as we experience reality, that may necessitate that plans be changed. Um, we don't add activities, meaning that we don't put additional time periods into the activities because we want ourselves to remain relaxed. And in case something happens, you know, I should have some extra time. So rather than, you know, showing it as 40 hours, I'll show it as 60 hours and so forth. And so we don't do padding because we've got billable hours, right? Billable hour means that for every hour of work that's done, we make a payment. So if we pad activities and we're showing something to be 60 hours in length as opposed to 40 hours, then that 20 hours additional will become billable. So that is going to increase your cost of your project for, for no odd reason. And then the, the, the cost is going to be violated. That baseline will get violated because you may actually end up performing the work in 40 hours. So then the question is what happened to the 20 hours of extra payment that you had scheduled for, right? So that creates a mess for us. Uh, make sure that you meet your deadlines and make sure that your deadlines are realistic, right? Now, if we start thinking about the different, um, you know, processes that were going on in a, in a project, we can start thinking about inputs, we can start thinking about the tools and techniques that will be required in order to convert those inputs into outputs and so forth, right? So let's forget for, for a moment about the inputs and let's forget also about the outputs. Let's concentrate upon the tools and techniques that are required because that's more important, right? So in order to define an activity, uh, in order to say that here's an activity that I need to do, uh, what kind of tools and techniques that we require? Well, we need a decomposition. So where do we find that decomposition? Well, that decomposition is present in the word breakdown structure, which has decomposed the pro project into the product and also into the processes. So the, these two decompositions are there in the WBS. Now, we may have templates, templates in the sense that the entire WBS may not be new for us. Certain things, certain activities may already have been decomposed by us in some previous project. So if we have a template, let's use that template in that WBS as well. We have this idea of rolling wave planning, meaning that we may not decompose the entire WBS at the beginning. Rather, we may decompose those activities or those things that are impending that have to take place in the immediate future. So those things that are not impending, they will be left at a higher level of abstraction. And those things that are impending, they will be uh, decomposed at a greater level. So that's the idea of, or a deeper level, right? That's the idea of a rolling wave. Then we have expert judgment. Now, where do we get expert judgment? Well, expert judgment comes to us from the people that actually perform the work, right? So ask them how long it would take. Ask them what is the minimum time period in which it would happen. Ask them 
you know, uh, how much money is required and so on and so forth, and the, the sequencing of the activities and so forth. So you've got experts around, make sure you ask these experts when you're going through this activity definition process. And then the planning component, well, the planning component's idea is that we are going to think about, you know, uh, where this this planning is taking place, um, who is going to be doing this planning? Uh, you know, when are these people going to uh, do the plans and so forth? So that's the idea of the planning component. Right? Then, um, I'll, as I said, I'll skip the inputs and the outputs, and uh, I've uh, just simply concentrated upon the tools and techniques that we have going on now. There are certain things that affect us, right? Certain things that we can't escape, which are a part of the environment, so to speak, or the milieu of the project. And these are um, things that we have to take into consideration while we're planning and, and organizing and our, our project before we put it into action, right? What is the enterprise environmental factors, right? We have to take these into consideration all the time. Now, what do we mean by enterprise environmental factors? Well, these would include the culture of the organization. What do we mean by the culture? Well, is it a uh, sort of a closed culture? Is it a independent culture? Is it a autocratic culture? Is it a bureaucratic culture? You know, what kind of a culture is it? What standards are you following in your uh, environment? What kind of facilities do you have? What kind of HR? Uh, policies and rules do you have and how do you administer your HR, right? What are the laws and regulations for, uh, you know, around your project? Um, your stakeholders, you know, are they risk averse type of individuals or are they risk taking type of individuals? So you have to understand uh, the nature of your stakeholders. You've got to have some sort of a project management information system. So where is that information system? Is it a purely digitized information system or is it a um, paper and pencil based information system? So what, what is the nature of that? You know, how do you authorize the work? Do you have any databases that you're using to um, you know, determine the duration of something or the cost of something. What is your marketplace like as a monopolistic, as a, you know, an open market and, and such things, right? So these are enterprise environmental factors. So you have to have those in the back of your mind. At the same time, you've got organizational process assets and assets are things that your organization possesses, right? So we're not generally talking here about physical assets, we're also talking about, you know, policies and procedures and guidelines and lessons learned and so forth. And those are important, right? So we're saying what are some of the learning or the knowledge assets that you have that you can use when you're making a plan. Now, the scope statement is something that had already been developed in the project scope management. And the scope statement basically is talking about what the project is going to do, what is going to be included in the project, and what is going to be excluded in the project, right? So we have to reflect again and again against this scope statement whenever we're doing planning at, at any level, uh, just to make sure that whatever uh, things or activities that we're planning are contributing directly towards the scope of the project. So if we find that there is something existing in our project which does not contribute to the scope of the project, then we get rid of that, right? So the scope statement is something um, like a mantra that we keep on revising. Uh, we keep on making sure that everything that we do somehow directly contributes towards that scope. From that scope statement, we developed the WBS, right? And the WBS is a work breakdown structure. It's a decomposition of your project into smaller and smaller pieces. And there are two levels of it. There's the product level and there's the process level. So the product division happens at, in the scope knowledge area and the process division uh, happens as a first step in the time knowledge area. Now, here you can apply different techniques. One is that you can actually go through the motions of decomposing an activity into smaller pieces. Or if you have previous experience, then you can, uh, you know, rely on things like 
heuristics, which are rules of thumbs. And, uh, and if you have a certain heuristic available, then please do use it because it makes your life much more easier. Heuristics such as, you know, five people are needed in order to do uh, 60 hours of work in three days. That's all right. So if you have a heuristic of that nature, you use that. Uh, for example, um, uh, foundation digging takes a minimum of uh, six days. So if you've got a heuristic like that, you shouldn't schedule then your uh, digging of the foundation to be in less than six days. You know, if you, you've got some sort of a learning or some sort of a ground reality that's sort of present uh, with you. So if you have that, you keep on using it. And you scale your work packages as needed, right? As needed to give you control. So certain work packages may be left at a higher level and you don't decompose them too much uh, because you've had a certain heuristic. So if you use that, that's fine. Other um, you know, work packages have to be decomposed more because you didn't have a heuristic or a rule of thumb. Now, along with the WBS, you've got a WBS dictionary. So you have to start filling in that dictionary as well. And the dictionary is going to help a person working on your project to understand what has been assigned to that particular person. So if, when you're assigning uh, you know, activities to individuals, those individuals would have certain questions such as when do I begin my work? When do I finish my work? How much money do I have available? How much time do I have available, right, et cetera? Um, who do I take the input from? Who is the approving body? Who do I uh, provide my output to? So these type of questions will be answered in the WBS dictionary. So we have to be filling that out as well. Now, uh, the project management plan uh, is always going to be there. And the project management plan is something that doesn't exist from the beginning of the project. Rather, it slowly develops as the planning of the project takes place, right? So you will have uh, concepts from the scope going into the plan, specifically the charter and the WBS would be going into it. We'll have things from the time knowledge area going into the plan, specifically the remaining part of the WBS with the work packages, the network diagrams, the Gantt charts, etc. you know, any control uh, type of mechanisms, concerns about the integrated change control, concerns about quality, about communications, about stakeholder management, about risk, et cetera. So all these things combine together to form your project management plan. And once the plan is completed, uh, then normally we go into the idea of execution. So uh, the project management plan is also being built and we're adding to that, right? Now, there's uh, different tools and techniques for the planning process and, and time uh, management. Uh, one is the concept of decomposition, the other is the use of templates, then we've got rolling wave planning, we've got expert judgment, then we've got a planning component. And I've uh, briefly talked about this already, so I'll sort of skip this for now and uh, I'll, I'll move to the next area. Right? Uh, the next concern is that we get outputs coming out. Right? Now, what kind of outputs do we get from defining our activity? Well, we get a list of our activities. Clearly, once we go through the process, we will have a list of activities. And we will have the attributes of each of these activities. Attributes such as the duration, attributes such as you know how many people are needed and so forth. Right? So we've got certain basic elements of that activity coming out. Normally, uh, there's uh, very few attributes. Uh, the normal attributes include your uh, name of your activity. The normal attribute includes the duration of that activity. Uh, it includes the predecessor of that activity, right? So that's the very basic. And then we will have some milestone list. So we, we will be taking that activity and defining certain uh, smaller goals for us and major goals for us. And that's the list of our milestones. And if we encounter any uh, changes requested, such as corrective or preventive, so we'll include that into the picture as well. Right? So we'll have a list of activities and we'll have their milestones and their attributes and requested changes. Now, once we have that list of activities, now the next step is to figure out the sequence amongst these activities. Right? So let's again now concentrate on the tools and techniques. Huh? 
we have now diagramming methods, right? We've talked about this a lot. We've got the precedence diagram method or we've got the error diagramming. Now, regardless of which diagramming method that we use, we're going to come up with the same answer, which is that we're going to find out the critical path duration, and we're going to be able to identify our critical path, and we will also identify our float times that are available, the free time available or the additional time that is available on activity. So one of these two techniques, the PDM or ADM, can be used to sequence the activities. But in order to sequence these activities, we must know the predecessors of each activity. And in order to find the critical part uh, duration, we must know the duration of each individual activity and its predecessors. Right? Now, once we have that, we get a scheduled network uh, diagram. Right? Now, if we have a template, we can use a template. If we don't have a template, we will develop the, uh, the diagram from scratch, and we will de determine the dependencies that exist amongst these activities. So what kind of dependencies are there? Well, there's different shapes and forms of them. We've got uh, some dependencies that we talked about, such as things have to happen in sequence, right? One after the other. So we may have a finish to start dependency, we may have a start to start dependency, a finish to finish dependency, or a, a start to finish dependency, one of the four, right? There's another form of a dependency that could also exist, which is the thought of a, a soft dependency versus a hard dependency. Soft dependency means that certain things have happened, certain other things have to begin, but certain approvals have to be uh, gained once activity A has finished and before B can begin. So us waiting for that approval to uh, process to run and gaining that approval is going to take certain uh, amount of time. And that lag that we encounter between two activities is basically a soft dependence. Now, we could also have a hard dependency where something has finished, but now it has to dry or it has to, uh, you know, get hardened before we can move to the next step. So we're, we're waiting before we can begin the next step because of laws of nature, for example, right? So that would be called as a hard dependency. So we have to think in these lines, you know, that these, these uh, relations, relational dependencies such as uh, FS, SS, uh, uh, you know, start to finish, finish to start, etc. Or we could have this other form of dependency called the soft and hard dependency. So we have to schedule um, these uh, soft and hard dependencies into our, our uh, schedule as well. Um, and we exercise them in, in the form of leads and lags, right? Lead means that, you know, we, we begin the next step before uh, the previous step has come into a, a, a complete uh, closure, uh, sort of doing a fast track. We lead into an activity. Right? We lag out of an activity, meaning we have finished something and uh, we can't begin the next one because we have to wait because of a soft dependency or a hard dependency. So that time period has to be integrated into the duration uh, of an activity while we're sequencing it. So we apply the lead and lags there, right? Um, now, if you remember, uh, these are the dependencies that we had. Uh, I just messed up the diagram, right? Um, activity A is going to finish before B can begin. This is called a finish to start dependency. Uh, a and uh, B and C are going to finish together. So this is a finish to finish dependency. C and D can begin together, so this is a start to start dependency. And we also have a start to finish and as a ridiculous dependency, so we don't want to um, have that in our project, rather we want to resolve that into the FS, FS, uh, FF or the SS. We don't want to have the SF dependency, so we'll uh, try to convert it into one of the others. Right? Now, if we take our uh, activities and put them on the network diagram, 
transfer the sample network diagram. This is what it looks like. Um, you can clearly see, see that A and B have a finish to start dependency. Uh, A and D, for example, have a start to start dependency. Uh, C uh, and F have, for example, a finish to finish dependency, right? So we get the network diagram and it takes a shape like this. Um, if we have a uh, activity on arrows diagram, then we may also have a rocket uh, line representing a logical activity or a dummy activity. This is not a physical activity, so it normally doesn't have any uh, time duration, rather it's introduced into the figure simply to maintain the logic of the um, sequence of activities that we have, right? And that uh, then can be applied onto our Gantt chart along with our you know, holidays, et cetera, and that gives us our, uh, our full schedule of the project, right? Now, we can have templates as well, right? So templates will help us to develop our diagrams faster. So if we have a learning organizational type of a thing going on and we've got lessons learned and documents of previous projects with us, then we can take their network diagrams, either pieces of it or the entire diagrams and, and use them and, uh, you know, recycle them so to speak and that basically forms for us a template. Now we may have um, uh, the, uh, this idea, uh, well we should have this, uh, idea of subnets or fragments. Right? What does a subnet or a fragment, uh, fragment means and what does it look like? Right? So for example, we have uh, these three uh, uh, circles here, we've got an activity and then that finishes another activity and then that finishes another activity. Um, and we can, we can sort of press on some magical minus button and hide all the other activities, the minor activities that happen between these two. So we can simplify our diagrams and go uh, and look at it at a higher level of abstraction. Then we can open up our diagrams and, and look at it at a lower level of abstraction. Right? So if our diagram is hiding information, this arrowhead here is then a hammock activity because it's hiding a lot of info. And if we could expand that, we'll find that there's another minor network diagram hidden in here. Uh, so this becomes uh, the hammock and this becomes the fragment, right? So if we go at a higher level of abstraction, meaning we're pressing on magical minus buttons in our uh, software to make our network diagram more simpler looking, more abstract looking. So in that way, we're looking at a hammock view of it. And if we expand the hammocks, we find that there's a lot of smaller uh, network diagrams inside it, so these uh, hidden, uh, network diagrams within the hammocks are known as the fragments, right? So fragments are hidden inside the hammock. Then we've got this idea of a hanger, right? So we need to talk about this. So let's have a look here, right? You've got activity C. Notice what's happening with C. It's, it's ending on a node, node number six. Uh, we've got an activity F that is ending on a node. It's finishing on six. You've got a dummy that's finishing on node three. You've got B, which is finishing on three. You've got a A finishing on two. You've got a D, which is finishing on four. You've got a E finishing on five. So what, what you should be looking at here is that none of your arrows are dangling in the air and they are you know, left unconnected. Every arrow is connected with some sort of a node. So if you find uh, you know, if you look at this diagram also, you're finding all the arrows are connected to some sort of a node, right? Meaning you don't have a arrow just sort of hanging out in the air. So if you find that you have a particular arrow that's just there, it's starting from a node, but it's not connected to some sort of a ending node, then we call that as a hanger. And we shouldn't be having hangers in our diagrams. So if you find that a hanger exists, you need to make sure that you connect it to some terminating node, right? Now, this is the second type of dependency that exists, right? Mandatory dependencies, uh, hard logic or hard dependencies, 
discretionary dependencies known as soft logic or soft dependencies right and external dependencies that are imposed upon us from the outside such as um, you know a dependency uh, caused because of uh, some law and regulation so you have done uh, something now you can't move to the next step because uh, there is a requirement for certain external third parties to come and perform uh, some sort of an inspection right so that's also a uh, type of a soft logic but it's kept separate because it's not your internal procedure related rather as a you know a third party cause dependency right so these are uh, another form of dependency that exists in a, in a project and we have to make sure that they're a part of our schedule as well right? uh, leads and lags i talked about this you lead in uh, to an activity so you're, you're bringing uh sorry where's my camera you're you're bringing two activities into each other this is a this is b they were going to happen in a finish to start relationship but you want to do part of b before the entire a has come to a conclusion right so if you're doing that you are leading into an activity so there must be some amount of time that uh, can be used as the lead in time you can't completely do that activity in a start to start manner so that amount of time if you can determine that as your lead time and the lag time is the waiting time so you've completed something and now you're waiting uh, uh, for the other activity to begin and uh, why are you waiting you're waiting because of maybe a, a soft logic or a hard logic right so there may be a, a physical requirement or there may be a procedural requirement and you're unable to begin the next step resource loading is now assigning each of the activity to a group or to an individual so if you assign me a particular activity and you say uh, you've got 60 hours of work to be done in a week and a half time uh, and you write my name against it and you, you make me busy uh, that means that you are loading yeah. you have loaded me onto that activity and if you assign some tasks to somebody else along with me so then you have now loaded that activity with two individuals right now we have to make sure then that we're leveling these resources as well. so what do we mean by leveling we have to make sure that there is no spike that exists what do i mean by that well let's suppose you do this let's suppose you have me and somebody else on your activity and you have loaded us to that activity and i find that i am doing 90 percent of the work and the other person is only given 10 percent so what has happened is that there's a spike on that graph if, if i were to graph this uh, and i am overloaded and that person is underloaded right so if we find this that means that you know some people are overloaded and some are underloaded so we need to balance right i i my workload needs to be uh, brought down and the other person who was only doing 10 percent of the work their workload needs to be increased so that there's a balance that me and the other person are doing equal number of work right so if i'm given you know uh, there's a 90 hour task and i'm given uh, 80 hours and the other person is given 10 hours clearly there's this mismatch they're only doing 10 hours of work i'm doing you know 80 hours of work so the the leveling means that you know we both get 45 hours of work or i get 40 and he gets you know maybe uh, 50 or some, some close enough balance uh, should be should be there right so we should be leveling these activities leveling is done by moving an activity in its free time what does that mean it means that that person uh, other person is free right i am too busy so you are taking my time and you are assigning that to that other person because that person is free so you are making that person more busier right so we are uh, doing this right? free time uh, could exist at 
the start of a project as as well as it could exist at the end of the project as well. So meaning that I may be, uh, you know, having too much to do at the beginning and the other person has too little to do at the end. So you, you balance this, us out and you ha have that person come and help me out towards the beginning of the project and I could go and help him out towards the end of the project. So you, you move us around. Right? Uh, normally we call the free time at the beginning of the project as a slack and any free time at the end of the project is called a float. Uh, so we are balancing our activities based upon that. Now the critical part, uh, I've done a separate video on this for us. Um, there were certain characteristics of the critical path, which is that it was the longest path through the network. It was the shortest amount of time in which the project could be completed. The critical path had zero floor. It could go through the dummy and we could have more than one critical path, right? So these are the characteristics of the critical path. And we have to recall that there is no float on the critical path, meaning there is no free time available towards the end of an activity. There may be slack time, which would be a part of our, our schedule, but there is no float time. There's no free time at the end. You cannot delay that activity by any amount of time. Right? We may have contingency floats in there, but we normally don't show our contingencies. We hide our contingencies. So, you know, it's a sort of like saying, give a camel an inch and it takes a yard. So if I were to tell you that, you know, do something in eight days, but I've got two extra days available, you will normally take then 10 days to do this. So I'm not showing you my contingency. I've, I've got a different network diagram with myself than the one that I'm, I'm showing to my project team members. Uh, so my diagram would have contingency. Right. So contingencies would be uh, the plan B or, you know, what if something goes wrong? So what I'll do in that uh, uh, to cover my time period. So I should have some additional time available with me. And normally that happens to exist in the form of contingencies. So as a project manager, I'll have certain contingencies. As a sponsor, I would have some uh, certain other contingencies, which I'm not aware of as a project manager. And the principal would have their own contingencies, which have not been uh, shown to the sponsor and, and so on to the project manager. So there's different level of contingencies. Um, and if, if the project manager exercises their contingencies and they need extra time, then they have to request the sponsor. And if the sponsor exercises their contingencies, then they have to request the principal and so forth. Right? So there's this, this level of contingencies that exist and they remain hidden from the person uh, lower down in the hierarchy. Now activity resource estimation is, is uh, basically estimating the time period of an activity, right? So one idea is, again, we're concentrating upon the tools and techniques set, is to ask an expert, ask the person who does that work again and again, and ask them how long certain things would take uh, to perform, right? So that's your expert judge. The other is to do an alternative analysis, right? So if, if I were to do something, uh, you know, in a, in a different way, or if I were to use machines and so forth, then how long will it take? So that is my alternative uh, analysis of an activities a resource estimation. Um, uh, how many people would be needed and so forth, right? Uh, published estimation data. So if there's some information available on how much uh, something cost or how much time certain things take or how many people are needed to do certain uh, pieces of work, then you should use those data. We have certain data about construction available in the form of schedules uh, of goods in which the prices of, of things are mentioned, right? Uh, or labor rates are mentioned. So if we have certain um, published data in, in that format, then we should be relying upon it because it makes our uh, planning much more easier. If you have uh, project management softwares, you should use them. If you don't, then you should try to, you know, encourage your, your project to uh, adopt certain project management software because it can help you. And you can also do uh, bottom-up estimation, right? Which is uh, as opposed to 
uh, your expert judgment or your um, use of heuristics, which is a top-down estimation. Right? Top-down estimation means that you don't go through the, the process of decomposing and come slower and slowly down to the small level to estimate. Rather, you make your estimate at the uh, topmost level. So for example, uh, you know, as an expert judgment, I can uh, perhaps inform you that it takes uh, 10 days to uh, develop the engine of a car, right? So that's a very top level estimation. I haven't gone through the motion of decomposing the engine into its components, the engine block, the assembly and so forth, and then saying how long each piece takes and then adding it up together. Rather, what I did was I said, well, the engine as a whole takes this much, right? But there are many cases, uh, there, there's many things that we're doing for the first time. So in that case, we don't have a uh, top-down estimate or a heuristic. You know? So in that case, we have to go through this decomposition and then we estimate at the smallest level and then add those estimates upward and say, well, overall, this is how long that particular activity would take or this is how much resources that we're going to be requiring to perform this activity and so forth. So if we're doing that, that is called the bottom-up estimation. Right? Now, normally the WBS is, uh, is a decomposition. So we're taking uh, the project and breaking it down into smaller pieces. Then we're estimating the time and the cost and the resources at the smallest level, and we're adding upwards and upwards and upwards, and then providing the overall estimate of the cost, the time, et cetera, for the project, right? So if you are using the WBS, then you are doing something called the bottom-up estimation. Uh, and it's also technically it's called a rolling up the WBS. So you and uh, you know, open it up like a sort of a scroll, and then you estimate at the lowest level, and, and you scroll it back up, and, and you roll it up. So that's why it's called a rolling up of the WPS. Now, alternatives have to be identified, and there's different techniques that are are useful in uh, determining alternatives, right? So one way is to do brainstorm. Right. Now, what is brainstorming um, and why is it uh, written at the very top? Well, brainstorming is um, an idea where people throw out their thoughts, uh, you note them down, you don't pass any value judgments. Once the group has exhausted all their ideas, um, then you evaluate and then you choose. Right? So we prefer this brainstorming uh, technique and project management because it is a way of generating solutions without judgment. Right? It allows for the group of individuals working with you to speak freely and to provide their uh, input without fear of being judged or uh, you know, without their idea not being considered uh, with merit and so forth. Right? So brainstorming is one way of coming up with alternatives. Another way is called adaptive reasoning, where you say, well, something worked in a similar situation elsewhere, but that situation was not 100% like what I have here. But if I adapt that solution, I can use it on this situation in which uh, I am in. Right? So if you're doing something of that nature, it's called adaptive reasoning. Uh, lateral thinking is another way that's also possible. Uh, in this, you, you diverge. You start thinking in, in strange ways and in strange thought patterns. And then uh, you, know, start, you start passing uh, judgments, etc. And you converge your thinking and you, you come to a point of view uh, on which all the concerned people present agree. So that is called lateral thinking. It's, it's a little bit different than a brainstorming because in lateral thinking, you have to first diverge in your thinking and then the group has to converge in their thinking. So there is judgments being passed while this convergence and divergence is taking place. Whereas in the brainstorming, that is not happening. Right? And there's also another way called mind mapping, um, which is sort of putting your, uh, 
uh, thought of, of the group onto a piece of paper and developing a uh, pictograph of, of the thought pattern that these individuals have. Uh, if you Google this, you'll find a lot of examples of mind maps on, on the internet, right? So you can use that. Now, uh, scheduling the activities can be done uh, you know, using very simple methods uh, other than software. So you can even use uh, sticky notes, those, those yellow sticky pieces of paper. And you can divide them into uh, uh, different quadrants. So the top left quadrant can, can be who is going to be doing the work. The estimates of the hours can be in the top right quadrant. The start date can be at the bottom left and the stop date at the bottom right. And then the name of the task and the specification can be written in the middle. And you can stick them onto uh, a piece of glass or some sort of a whiteboard and you can move them around to figure out you know, the dependencies and, and, and the activities. And then you can develop your network diagrams and, and that way as well. But you know, we've done a more sophisticated way of doing it using the Project Libre software. Uh, the activity duration estimation, right? These are the uh, tools and techniques for it. Expert judgment, ask the expert. Analogous estimation, analogous means that you're using some sort of an analogy. So you're saying that, you know, uh, we built a thing somewhere else and it, it costed us 10,000. Uh, this is an you know, similar to it. So we're, we're drawing an analogy. Uh, it's uh, it's a little bit different, but it's almost the same. So let's use that uh, estimate, right? So that's an analogous estimate. Then you've got parametric estimation. So parametric estimation, for example, uh, if I ask you how many bricks are there in a wall, right? So you should be asking me uh, what is the square foot area of and then you should explore how many bricks fit into one um, square foot of a wall or into one square meter of the wall. And uh, you can say, well, if, if one square meter has uh, you know, 40 bricks, then a 100 square meter wall will have how many bricks, right? So if, if we do something of that nature, that is called a parametric estimate. Uh, in our estimates, we should also be uh, using the three-point estimate. And if you um, uh, remember, I, I don't remember if I used this term before, but the three-point estimate is the same as the PERT, which is the program evaluation and review technique, right? So the optimistic duration plus the four-time uh, most likely duration plus the pessimistic duration, the whole divided by six is the three-point estimate for the uh, burn, right? So use that. And reserve analysis, uh, you know, think about how much uh, extra you have available either in, in money or in the form of time period, etc. So you're putting that into the uh, picture. Um, it's, it's a buffer for scheduling for, for the rest, right? For the unforeseeable, right? So that's your reserve time. Right. So analogous estimation is a form of expert judgment. Estimate the time to do task or to do a current project by extrapolating from actual cost of a previous project. Parametric estimation is a mathematical modeling type of a technique. Uh, and you're saying, uh, you know, I, I could uh, say, you know, this many bricks in a square meter. So I've got this many square meters, so how many bricks do I need, right? I can find that as sort of like a regression, right? Or we can do a learning curve. Learning curve means that, you know, my um, the first time I do something, it will take me a bit longer. Uh, the hundredth time that I do something is going to take me much less time, right? So where are my team members? Are my workers on the learning curve? Are they you know, behind on the learning curve? Are they far ahead on the learning curve? Right? So for example, the first burger that I make is going to take me a very long time, but the hundredth burger or the thousandth burger is going to take significantly less. So where is my team member on this learning curve? Are they at the beginning of the learning curve? Are they going to take, uh, are they going to be slow? Are they far ahead on the learning curve? Meaning they are experts. Are they going to do it uh, much faster? Right? So we have to be thinking in, in those terms as well. Uh, Bottom-up estimation, I've already explained that, right? So we'll, we'll spend more time on that. Now, 
the critical path analysis, we uh, just talked about the ways of doing it. So we can do it using the AOA or the ADM method. And uh, we use the PERT uh, in, in, uh, while doing the critical path. So the PERT is uh, also known as the three-point estimate. So we've already talked about this. Um, this is the formula, the three-point estimate or the PERT has been written there. Um, there are some additional formulas. Uh, we won't be using them in this course because this is the basic course, but we could also calculate the standard deviations or the variances uh, from the PERT formula as well, but I'll, I'll skip that for now. Uh, so I won't talk about that. Uh, and lastly, we've got the schedule development taking place. So once we've got our uh, you know, PERT CPM diagram, we place them onto the Gantt chart we add our lead times, lag times, our dependencies, et cetera, and our, uh, you know, what if analysis and put our risks and everything into it, apply our calendars, and that gives us our uh, completed schedule of the, of the project, right? Um, so once we've got the project done, I'm skipping these because we've already done these. So once we've got the project done, uh, we apply, uh, Sorry, we've applied our calendars, etc., lead lags, etc. Uh, we get our uh, Gantt chart and we get our uh, project's duration uh, and, and working date. Right? So the next step is then to um, put into motion this idea of control. So how do we uh, do this? Well, we have to set up some sort of a reporting um, a mechanism. Uh, but in order to report something, we have to collect the data. So we have to put in a monitoring uh, mechanism. Then first, once the monitoring is done, data will come, we'll evaluate that data, and that data will be reported. And then based upon that data's report, we'll find where the variances are, how far ahead are we, how far behind are we, are we on schedule or not, etc. So if we are on schedule, no control will be exercised. If we are behind schedule, then we have to exercise control. Right? So that concludes pretty much our um, lecture on uh, time management. And uh, the next step is then to move into project cost management. And we'll be using now the time periods, um, the schedules that we have developed for the project and the estimates that have been made in it. Uh, in order to determine how much money that project is going to cost for us, right? So you have to remember that the main concern of the planning so far has been to figure out the duration of the project and then figure out the cost of the project. Uh, the rest of it is going to be then much more easier, which is simply concerned about the implementation of the project. Then, right? So for right now, um, this is uh, the end of uh, project time management. So the next step is to talk about costing and figuring out the cost of the project. Thank you very much for listening. Take care.